Hello, everybody, and thank you for your patience. Um, I had some interesting moments there connecting and um, uh, being confounded by myself and systems. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, let's get into interoperability uh, today. Um, my name is Liz Stokes, and um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting. Um, I am coming to you from Sydney, Australia, which is uh, the where I am based at the moment. Um, uh, tr the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation like to pay my respects to elders past and present and uh, extend that respect to any First Nations people who are with us today. So let's get into interoperability without all of that faff. Um, and I am going to use that picture of myself so I don't really look at it. Um, so Matthias talked on Tuesday about the reasoning behind um, interoperability and its place amongst the fair data principles and showing some examples of what goes wrong when you don't have common agreed upon standards and talking about the utility of having the data schema with the data which brings everything together. So today um, I'm going to pretty much go over this same stuff um, and hopefully and go a little deeper into what it is um, when we're talking about vocabularies and share a couple of tools and some resource, resources to help you get, um, get around interoperability. Okay, as you know, um, you can always join us on the Slack channel for any questions that come up. Um, and if you've got any questions um, from what I'm saying today, please throw them into either the question tab or the chat tab and um, we will have a Q&A in about half an hour. I'll try and speed up somewhere, okay? So interoperability is what I think we're gonna get over today. What does it even mean? Um, talking about, oh, well, let's just get into it, okay? So to be interoperable, which is basically data that is interpretable by a computer um, so that data can be combined with other data, the data needs to be, um, will need to use community agreed formats, languages, and vocabularies. Uh, the metadata will also need to, be, um, need to use community agreed standards and vocabularies and contain links to related information using identifiers, which is essentially what that I3 points there means. Metadata including qualified references to other metadata. Now, um, so let's have a look at all of those principles in, in another way. So data that is interpretable by computers, community agreed formats, languages and vocabularies. And the metadata itself um, also has some of these fair principles, okay? So um, we also use community agreed standards and there are links to related information using identifiers. So this is my first warning here. We might just get into the weeds, which is good, okay? Because when we're talking about vocabulary, classification systems, determining community standards inevitably, we'll get into value judgments as to what is a weed, what is grass, and what distinctions are helpful now and in the future. Being humans, we don't always get it right, so it's a process and we all learn to trust in the process. Um, and I hope that by going through talking about some fair looking vocabularies um, and a couple of metadata schemas, we'll even get over to linked data and um, as a way of coming back and having another perspective on what interoperability means. So um, hopefully I can get to ontologies, but if we don't, I'll just send you off to some awesome things. Okay. So community standards, okay, let's um, focus now on community standards around um, research data. And what kinds of um, scenarios might people be um, thinking of or um, when we think about um, what a community agreed upon standards might help us solve? So here are a few ones from the fairsharing.org website. Um, so here we have the researchers talking about uh, my funder's data policy recommends the use of established standards, but which are the ones 
widely endorsed and applicable standards for my crop data. Um, funders and journal editors may be asking, what are the mature standards and standard compliant databases that we should be recommending to our authors? Um, maybe the journal editors are looking for a repository um, that they can use to um, host their um, host uh, related data from the publications that they publish. We, um, down in the bottom right corner, we have librarians and data managers who are looking at um, genomic rice data um, in a particular format, which has now been deprecated. So they're looking to find out what's the new format and what can they do to migrate leg their legacy data into um, a format that might be more widely used um, or meets current, current standards. And then finally, we have curators and developers who are looking at um, um, sharing social science data. And so their questions are, what, we need a standard for doing this, but who should we talk to and what options are there out there? Um, I would do recommend the fair sharing policy. As you can see in that little circle in the middle of this um, infographic, it's a collection of standards policies and databases, so it indexes um, FAIR databases, um, FAIR databases, policies and standards that uh, you can or use in an effort to facilitate the fairification of our repository services. Okay, but you know, um, this, is, this is my um, things can all go pear-shaped um, and humans don't always get it right. So what you can see here is a picture of Copernicus's heliocentric solar system, where you've got the sun or sol in the middle, and then these concentric circles um, showing the um, orbits of the planets around the sun. Um, so it took us humans a while to figure out where we were in the solar sy system, but not just figure out, but also accept and incorporate that into a socially acceptable worldview. Uh, it's interesting um, that we know now that Copernicus drew on the science from many Islamic astron astronomers who were leading the charge there. And he even delayed publication of this model for years and years because he didn't have enough data or really proof his theories. And then 50 years later when Galileo um, used the telescope to prove this, um, well, his purposes um, were more, he was actually trying to change um, community standards and um, unfortunately he was tried by the Inquisition and then placed under house arrest until he died. So hopefully um, community development of metadata standards is not necessarily going to be that difficult, um, but I do um, want to reassure anyone um, who's getting fired up about this that, well, humans are funny and cultural change is hard and you might as well ask any data librarian who's had to promote data management plans how that goes. So let's move on to what things make it easier to help aid interoperability. So I'm going to talk a bit about vocabularies and why we would want to have vocabularies in our um, in our research data. So vocabulary is my standard way of setting out common language. In a, that a discipline has agreed to use to refer to concepts of interest in that discipline. Uh, researchers planning observation or surveys need to define their data items clearly, and an agreed vocabulary or standard um, makes a good starting point for translating concepts into other vocabularies so that collaboration can occur. So we've got vocabularies happening at the data description level, and we also have vocabularies um, working at the um, at the metadata description level as well. So I'm going to start off by talking about the metadata scheme for aggregating Australian research data. And I think I've made some mention of this previously. Now I'm going to get really into it. So it's the registry interchange format for collections and services, uh, affectionately known as RISTIA. Uh, it's based on an ISO standard um, and 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 yet, unlike the ISO standard which it's on, um, it is free to access and you can um, check out the vocabularies that RISCS uses as well as um, you 
you can even repurpose it yourself. Okay, so its main purpose is in aggregating Australian research data so that it can be displayed in Research Data Australia, the platform that ARDC um, provides. Um, and the two important things that I wanted to focus on in terms of interoperability is that this uh, metadata schema outlines, establishes yes, relationships between object, uh, objects using qualified references, and it also uses a bunch of controlled vocabularies. Now let's have a look at um, a, well, this is a little like an ontology model in that this diagram is showing the relationship between different objects within the metadata schema. So RIFCS has four um, objects in its registry, four types of objects. They're parties, parties, which represent people or groups, collections, which are an aggregation of physical or digital objects. So a collection object is what we use for describing a data set or a collection. So they're both types of collection. Um, then we've got activity as the third, um, third object there, which usually translate to a research project, um, but could be other activities. Uh, and then service. Um, so these four objects, um, come straight from the ISO standards, okay? And so you can see there between these different um, uh, between these different objects, you can see little arrows pointing to things that can happen between these objects and how they're related. And those of you who have fond memories of our um, webinars on protocols um, should hopefully be gratified to see down here that even this, there's a line out to services which are delivered through protocols, okay? Um, and that's going to aid interoperability, okay? And then over here on the left, the access policy. So you could you could imagine actually we've we've covered access and protocol interoperability previously, um, and now we're moving on to looking at how the metadata might identify these relationships. Now let's go in. So actually, I'm going to jump over um, to some of the, well, some of the vocabularies that we have. Let's see if that works. I might need to, oh, pretty good, I think. Okay. Hopefully you can see, oh yes, yeah, so this is a list. What I've just linked to is a list of the vocabularies that RIFCS uses. You can see up the top a little uh, index of the different vocabulary. And then down here we get um, some definitions of what they are. So what I would like to highlight here, for example, are the access rights type here. And you can see, so there are three access rights types, open, conditional or restricted. And there's some information about when you might want to use those particular types of access rights. Okay. Um, another interesting um, vocabulary um, or another way of thinking about these vocabularies is that they're a list of options, okay? Is the date type, so I'm going to scroll down a little, close your eyes if this makes you dizzy, um, down to the date type, okay. Ah, so as you can see here in this date type, all of the date types um, that RIFCS is using for collections is actually, if you can notice, little DC prefix. These are reusing elements from the Dublin Core Metadata Schema. In fact, Dublin Core Terms. Um, and we can see, because there are different kinds of dates that pertain to a collection or a data set. So when it was made available, when it was created, maybe it might have been accepted or submitted at particular dates, or it might be a range for which that resource or thing is valid. Okay. Uh, and I might come go. I'm going to scroll a little more again. So um, avert your eyes. Okay. I'm going to come down to the identifier type. Here's a very useful um, vocabulary list of um, persistent identifiers. And as you can see there, they all have down the side um, their prefixes, acronyms, um, and what they stand for. So. That's a, that's a fun time um, in our 
in our voc the vocabulary that we that we use. And in fact, I might just jump over to Research Data Australia. Let me make that a bit nice and big. Okay. So back over to Research Data Australia. These controlled vocabularies come into play when we're using um, search and find facets. So it's actually if I clicked over to choose the public, the accessible online um, term, uh, little checkbox there, this should, um, this will return results which have, I'll just click on the first one there, um, results which um, have open access. Um, metadata, okay, or open access research data, okay. Um, and as you can see there, when we look down at the access part, we can see that it's open and we are going to show um, the metadata sent us to the correct record. I'm going to um, scroll down a little here and just um, take you into the relationship there. So here is a, um, a little graph. So thinking back to when Matthias was talking to you about um, uh, linked open data and having um, different subjects and objects and their relationship or the predicate um, that identifies the relationship between them, here is a nice um, diagram that show graph that shows you how these things are related to each other. So you can see that these little green circles. Um, represent people or in risk CS these would be party records okay so a person is a party according to RIF, the risk CS metadata schema and this particular one um, Lisa Vero professor is um, is collector of and also principal investigator of this particular data set here okay which is also associated with these other four data sets uh, in, in this little graph. So this graph shows us the relationship between these, um, these different objects. Um, we've also got a, we can see that there's a thing, a website here that's also listed and um, that is related to um, one of these data sets as well. Uh, and if I even go down the bottom to my review, registry view, this will help us. Okay, so now we see um, RIFCS in all its glory, okay? And we get to see the metadata elements here, down the side, in bold, and then the values, um, the values of the metadata that have been provided, okay? And if I take um, you to the related object, and this is really the this is the qualified that the metadata provides qualified um, links to other metadata. We can see that this um, uh, this record is a collection, and it's a type which is a data set, and it is related to these other objects, which are party records. And I think we can see other, it's also related to these other objects which are collections, okay? Now, let's move on a little, shall we? Um, okay. Oh, I could, this is where we get into the weeds, everyone, okay? So, um, you could have a look, you could check out, um, um, have a look at um, RIFCS in its schema documentation. And that's what we're looking at now in the components, right? Okay. For example, we could go down to what a collection looks like. And this kind of documentation that you get to see um, is telling us, um, is, is telling us, um, how to understand, or rather it's telling machines and I guess data librarians, um, how to understand the, um, the elements and how they relate to each other in this metadata schema. So um, this is quite a formal way of describing 
the data model that is used for uh, resources that are ingested and displayed in research data in Australia. Um, I'm going to draw back from this now, but know that you can go in there and explore it any time. Can you still hear me? I'm going to trust that you can. Um, yes, we okay. can still hear you, Liz. Thank you. Okay, now let's go back to our webinar. Right, okay. So remember the magpie, okay, that um, Matthias was talking about, um, where, um, uh, so actually what I really want to talk about is another metadata schema called Dub uh, Darwin Core. Sounds very similar to Dublin Core. Okay, um, and the reason I wanted to talk about this is because this is an example of a metadata schema um, that has undergone some change. Okay, so this diagram, you don't have to learn it um, really, and in fact, this was an early diagram or representation of Dublin, of Darwin Core. I apologise. Okay. Um, as it has become a widely used open access standard for biodiversity data. So it was developed to provide a simple way to document and share information about species occurrences, whether that was in the field or a museum collection. So it, it's been used to integrate hundreds of millions of records through um, a, a global um, biodiversity federation organization. Um, and it's a, because it's so widely used, um, it has um, it has benefit for bringing together lots of different kinds of um, contributions. So, what I wanted to tell you about here is, as you can see in that middle. So here we have Darwin Core, this representation of how it contains location, organism data, geological context, and taxon data. Okay. Um, and you can see down the bottom here, you can see that there are a few um, uh, metadata standards that contribute to Dublin Core. So these are being reused. So there are some Dublin Core elements that are, are being reused by Darwin Core. And there are also, sorry, mouse is doing funny things. There are also um, links out to other extensions. Okay, I'll take you up to. Um, Apple Core, which is an extension of Darwin Core, but focused on um, herbaria and plant stuff. Okay. Now, so Darwin Core, um, this was what it looked like in 2012. More recently, um, there have been additions to Darwin Core that uh, support the aggregation of sampling event data sets. Okay. So there's a new event core component of Darwin Core that places the sampling event at the centre of the simplified data set. And so it links its protocol um, and by which I mean when I say protocol I mean how they I say how they do the science, not how they transfer the data. Um, efforts and measurements to the species occurrence derived from the sampling event. Um, okay. So as a result, researchers can tap into more complex and quantitatively rich, richer records for analysis and combine them alongside others which are focused on single organisms or individual taxa, okay? So these changes could lead to improvements in the quality and usefulness of data sets that are already published on, um, for example, Atlas of Living Australia and other um, biodiversity um, data repository. So this is where I want to get into this linked open data stuff. Okay. Um, wait a minute. Let me try and back that up with a back that up with a picture. So coming back to the magpies here. Okay. So we've got all these occurrence records here. Um, and I'm just taking you down to how um, Darwin Core metadata schema, so too do these other online resources. And so 
by being able to link um, link this record to other data out out there, we can. This is the this is where we're getting to the utility of linked data and and fair data that um, that we're using persistent identifiers to link between different repositories, and that when we have um, well described data models, then it can be that the data can be reused um, more efficiently by um, by humans and also um, the systems and machines that we create. Okay, um, here is a nice example of mapping different kinds of mapping um, different kinds of data to Darwin Core terms here. Um, what I'm sharing with you now is a um, it's a page page from the ALA blog, and you can see here raw data, which has been collected. This um, this is um, structured data in a table, um, which um, has been designed to serve the purposes of data collection. Okay, so it's easier to um, say what um, you've got your um, uh, vernacular names down here, the purple swamp hen, and then um, we have at each different we have different columns for the different localities. Okay, but this is not how Darwin Core is laid out. Darwin Core is laid out in a, um, uh, a different format, and that's the second table here. And you can see how instead of having um, see how instead of having the date up here in the in the top left corner, we have date information coming through under event date, okay? And then we have the vernacular name, locality, okay, indicating um, different components of the data, okay? This is actually a really good blog and I, um, I reckon you should have a read of it. But right now, it's time for me to get back to linked open data. Um, yeah. So this might be. I wanted to get into this by the end of this thing because um, the this is this is this illustrates the five stars of linked data um, that have been defined by Tim Berners Lee, and I think it's a really interesting way of looking back at interoperability and the fair data principles because it has a lot in common. Um, with how we talk about these principles. So, um, but it's different, so it's not the same, but um, I hope by offering it up, it, it can give you something to think about. So these stars um, indicate levels of um, things that you can do to publish data and make it available to others. Um, so the first thing um, is step one here, and you get one star for publishing data on the web. Okay, making it available. And in this case, um, they've used a PDF to publish it, put it up there. Um, and they've also put a license on it. That's the first kind of step, so that people know that they can reuse it. Step two um, is um, making that data available as structured data. So we can see we've moved from tables in a PDF to actually tables in an Excel spreadsheet. Good step. Um, that means that people can more easily grab that data um, and do other things with it, plug it into some analysis, uh, statistical software or other things. Um, except um, we're using a proprietary format here. Um, we're reliant on being able to read Excel documents, Excel spreadsheets. So the third star is to um, use an open format. Okay? And here we have CSV um, representing the translated value format of data, um, which can be read by anything. CSV is an open format. So step four, um, and here we have the beginning of the resource descriptive framework, or RDF. Um, and one of the cornerstones of resource descriptive framework is to use URIs. Um, or uniform resource identifiers to point to things so that other people can point to your stuff. So using URIs 
to point to um, concepts in your vocabulary, for example, or in your metadata schema, or in your or in your ontology. And step five, the five stars of linked open data, are uh, where you get to um, linking your data to other data so that you can provide context. Okay, uh, and that's really where we get into um, the that heady world of linked open data um, and query across across many things. Um, so that's the future, right? Okay. Um, and I should caveat, it's not necessarily um, so that that must all happen for all data. Um, but it is, a, it is a significant driver. One thing I also wanted to highlight is that the Australian government have a digital continuity 2020 policy. Um, um, and I wanted to share this with you because it's another um, facet of how interoperability is um, driving change in how we how we manage data at the government level. And this here is a component from that policy. Agencies will have interoperable information systems and processes that meet standards for short and long term management, improve information quality and enable information to be found managed, shared, and reused easily and efficiently. And um, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a brave thing. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Sorry, Siri. Um, but um, so the National Archives have some good resources and scenario mappings for government agencies who are um, building interoperability into their systems and processes. So I just wanted to hear highlight some of those scenarios for um, for things that you might do if you wanted to take this sort of interoperability a little further. Um, and that me, um, relies on looking at streamlining business processes. Um, you might undertake a legacy data migration to move data from um, due to upgrade your um, metadata or maybe it's looking at a data exchange activity with stakeholders or um, reviewing the standards that you have for data publication and sharing um, anyhow you'll have you'll get a copy of these slides and you can go and see those scenarios um, which are in friendly um, storyboard maps okay um, I'm going to kind of skip over ontologies at the moment, um, but here are a few nice little ontological tools, um, if you like. And actually, um, on if I did this again, I would probably start off with a comic of Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage, um, and then have a look at how um, someone has created an ontology of that comic. Um, and here, let's finish up with Research Vocabularies Australia, okay? Because um, here at the ARDC, we've got some tools that can help you um, develop your own vocabularies and publish them so you can um, make them fair. So our vocabulary services, um, well, a vocab service um, indexes uh, vocabularies um, to, and, and it can tag items in catalogues and search portals. And that can help you provide keywords um, and other other search aids. And um, the service can also relate to machine-to-machine -machine services, which would support activities like creating, managing, and querying vocabularies. So in the ARDC vocabulary services suite, we have um, edit we've got an editor, a vocab editor, um, which is called Pool Party. So we contract um, the software Pool Party, where you can create and manage vocab. Um, you can collaborate with others and browse concepts using that built-in visualization tool. And you can also query your vocab from a Sparkle endpoint as well, which is very handy. Um, we also have a repository, which is where the um, any vocabs you create can be stored in, um, and that's where you can publish it. So it can be, um, so your vocabulary could be accessed via the portal at Research Vocabularies Australia. Um, and this is here are a few things that you can, um, if you are using the repository on the other side, um, um, 
and the, and the portal, um, it will enable um, other people to find your vocabulary as well. So I feel like on all around the world a little bit um, in interoperability and there are a lot of different um, directions that we can go in. Um, but in sort of tying this up together, um, I'd like to kind of finish with this idea that um, if, if you want interoperability to work for you in making data fair, then um, it's important to consider that the data model you're using for your metadata is well defined and well structured. So it uses um, uh, it, it uses standards such as the Resource Descriptive Framework (RDF) or it uses um, um, standards for describing structured data, um, so that um, machines can parse that information and humans can also identify it. Um, secondly, in using controlled voc vocabularies, which are also well documented, people can access them and are resolvable by um, using PIDs. Now, that's another way of enabling um, your data to be fair because the, um, the vocabularies and the metadata that you're using to describe those, that data are also fair. So they're findable, accessible, and interoperable, reusable. And finally, one part of that is that metadata includes cross-references which provide contextual meaning to the data. And that's the, um, that's the beauty of linked data and um, what we hope to, to enable. So um, before we get into questions and answers, um, I'm going to remind you um, to don't forget to fill in the feedback at the end of this uh, webinar because um, it's really helpful for us to know how we're going and sometimes at the end of a long webinar um, that's when the questions come up. So um, just in case you don't feel like you've got any questions now, just giving you an out, a little out there. So, Matthias, that's enough from me. Um, does anyone have any questions about all of this interoperability? Yes, so we have one question so far. Uh, and that is about uh, RIFCS and, and RDA. Uh, so the relationship of parties linked to data set, um, yep. how is that connection made? Is that manually entered in the related objects field in RDA? Yes. So it's, well, the related objects Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Good. So the related objects in RDA are um, is tend to be. Oh, let me go back to it. Um, While Liz is doing that, I would like to remind everybody that if you do have a question, please enter it into the questions module. Nice. Okay. So for so the, let me get this straight. The question was um, relating parties to each other or parties to collections. Uh, relating uh, literally, the question was relating parties to a data set. Okay. So so you can have the you don't need to supply party records necessarily alongside collection records. So most of the time you're actually sending um, sending the collection records that say the collection um, is related to a party. And because of that link that has been established, then there's also, then um, RDA will infer the relationship to the party from, the, no, to the collection from the party. So it's not, um, we, I guess this is going to sound really confusing, but um, when you send collection records, when you send records to RDA, it's not like you're sending all the collection ones with their relationships plus the, um, the parties with their own relationships as well. And so you had 
these sets of relationships that are in parallel. They link up with each other because of the persistent identifiers that you have included. So, um, so the relationship happens um, doesn't have to happen on both in the metadata. It can just be one because the bidirectional link has been inferred. I'm not sure that that's actually very clear in my description. I apologise. No, that's clear enough. Okay, uh, we do not have any more questions in, um, but we are getting close to the hour. Uh, so I'll probably hand back to you, Liz, to wrap up. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Um, gee, you've been really quiet today. That's been nice. Um, and I hope to see you sometime on the Slack and in our community discussions this week, uh, next week, there next week. Okay, thanks very much. Bye.